There are days when I walk through my yard and I think, oh, if only I had a solution for that spot. Or why do all the plants in my window box die? Welcome to the Wisconsin Gardener. I'm your host, Shelley Ryan. Today's program, Problem Solvers, refers to both people and plants. We'll start with a visit to Sturgeon Bay, where we meet two gardeners who turned their narrow, steep property into a haven for hostas and art. We'll also discuss drought. It does far more than turn our lawns brown and crunchy and can affect full-grown trees for years to come. We'll learn what we can do to help. At Rotary Gardens in Janesville, we meet a tough plant, the perfect solution for hot, dry places, moss roses. Now I know what to plant in my window box. And in Mineral Point, we visit a garden, a true oasis, where once stood an auto salvage yard. Talk about problem solvers. It's all coming up on The Wisconsin Gardener. Funding for The Wisconsin Gardener is provided in part by the Wisconsin Master Gardener Association. I'm with Doug Henderson, part of a gardening team extraordinaire that has uh, solved a really tough problem. Thanks for letting me come and oh, visit. Thank you for coming, Shelley. We always love to have you in our garden. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's not my first you know, visit speaking here. Speaking of problems, <laughs> uh, let, me, let me just uh, tell you a couple of them that we've had, uh, we do have. Uh, one of them is the fact that the lot is 100 feet wide and 420 feet long. So it's a very long wow. property compared to the width. And what we've had to do is to try to figure out how to garden in that. And we decided that we would make little rooms so that it doesn't look like a giant long uh, roadway. Or water slide or something. Right. <laughs> and, and then one of the, with the lot, we have two distinct levels. Uh, this level up here that we're standing on, and then one that, uh, down at our house uh, on the bay, which is right uh, on bedrock, which this one is also. These are both old beaches because we're seven miles north of Sturgeon Bay. Correct, and, uh, and they're ancient beaches, uh, limestone uh, base. Uh, so every place you see a garden, uh, you're going to see a raised bed uh, garden. We've truckload, we brought in truckloads of soil to make these work. Because they're not going to grow on limestone. No, they're so not. So lots and lots of soil. But you know, what I'm also seeing are these awesome, what look like ancient structures just coming out of the ground. What are these? These, these are one of the ways that we've divided uh, garden space, and these are uh, old septic tank tops. <laughs> So, uh, New or used? <laughs> no, they've never been used, but okay. they've been sitting in a, a cement yard for many, many years. So uh, the man that owned it was nice enough to let us buy them, and uh, we've used them as divides in the garden. Um, and, and we also add things that we find, like the bowling balls here. Uh, and in addition, we, we also add uh, lots of uh, uh, garden art. Uh, we are uh, fused glass artists, uh, so a lot of our artwork is found throughout the garden. Well, and a lot of color in between the ancient artifacts, well, fake ancient artifacts, I mean, you really add life to the different garden right. rooms, and too. Right, and this is a second uh, garden that's using septic tank uh, tops, and this one we call the moon garden. Well, uh, because of the Asian look? I mean, those look like almost Chinese they, coins. They almost do, and uh, we've had a lot of people comment on that. I really like that garden. Now, what, what also I see a lot of, because you have a shade issue. Very much shade, and lots of our plants repeat throughout the garden, and because most of the garden is shade, uh, we have lots of different uh, shade plants. And Barbara's the one to talk to about the shade plants, because uh, she knows all the names. Well, then I'm going to talk to your wife and get some more information. Great. Thanks. Thank you. I am with the other half of the Henderson gardening team. This is Barbara Henderson, and you're the plant person. I am the plant person. I just love plants. Any so kind of plants. So you do all plants. the hard work. <laughs> oh, I don't know. It's I do the fun work though. I get to buy all the plants and plant all the plants. And I have a lot of favorite plants. And one of them right here is Illumination Rose Begonia that I use in many containers throughout the garden. So, well, I love the way it pops in, in those kind of rusty uh, containers. But, you know, I visited here before, and I see this in almost every one of your garden rooms. And it's kind of the continuity that holds this whole long, narrow spot together. It is. I used to be a weaver, and so the idea of weaving plants in and out of the garden to create 
a sense of continuity works great for me. Now so, you have a couple of others that are kind of your, your stand your standbys, I guess. Or I standards. do like this. I do like this illumination rose begonia, but I also like the dragon wing red begonia. Okay. I love the red, the way the red pops with all the green backgrounds, and I like the marguerite sweet potato vine for just its for trailing, trailing, flowing effect that just again gives a, that spot of bright color. Now it looks to me like you like all hostas, but any favorites? <laughs> I love hostas. There are so many now, but I have two favorites that are just old time favorites. Which one is Summon Substance, which is a huge goldish yellow chartreuse leaf, crinkly, and the other one is Gold Standard. Both of those light up a, a space in the shade really, really well. Well, uh, now before we move into another one of your garden rooms, and this is more intimate, we have to talk about one of your other passions, and that's art. In this mm -hmm. case, glasswork. Now, you made these. I did make these. I love making faces and people. You'll see some of the faces and people throughout the garden. So and yes. So this is fused glass. This is fused glass, made awesome. in a kiln. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it's uh, on one of your found objects it again, is. too. It we, is. We found a, lots of pieces from old houses to put this place together. So come on in. This we call the Green Lattice Garden. Beautiful. Now I see another a sense of continuity. I'm seeing bowling balls everywhere. I do like bowling <laughs> balls, too, and found objects everywhere, too. So, and now this garden is much more intimate, but again, you're dealing with shade issues. So I see hostas of, not just the two kinds you mentioned, hostas of all kinds all over the place. I think so. I, I, I just love the way the texture of the hostas, all the different colors and patterns. Uh, this is a lot of work making this whole area tie in together, but it's absolutely beautiful, Barbara. Thank you, but it's also a lot of fun. Oh, well, we'll just give you all the credit then. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Shelley. We're here to focus on drought. Now that may seem kind of silly when everything around us is lush and green, but if you look above me, this pagoda dogwood is showing curling leaves, which is a sign of stress from a recent drought. So uh, just because things are green, don't be fooled into complacency. And I am with Lisa Johnson, and she is the Dane County UW Extension Horticulture edu Educator. And Lisa, we have, I mean, kind of two topics to cover with drought, the current effects, and then surprisingly, and m more worrisome, the far-reaching effects of drought. So current, current effects include things like the curling leaves, what right. else? Uh, well, early obviously fall dead grass. color, dieback, yes, certainly the dead grass, any of that. But the far-reaching effects we're going to see on our woody plants, our trees and our shrubs. We're going to see a lot more attacks by borers. We're going to see spring dieback. We're going to see any number of diseases that normally wouldn't be such a problem, becoming a problem one, two, three years into the future. So, well, we had a, a drought of historic proportion in 2012. So you're saying one, two, three years after that, we're going to be having problems with e even mature trees? That's correct, yeah. And uh, so give us some examples of things to look out for then. Okay, for things, 
Uh, immediately the next spring after a drought, you might still see some dieback that occurred over oh. the winter. Okay. Um, particularly on conifers, you might see loss of needles. You might see purpling needles. Uh, there's also a beetle called an Ips beetle that is a stress-related insect that you will see on conifers. On our oak trees, there's two-line chestnut borer, and this a white paper birch that I'm sitting next to, uh, unfortunately, is the victim of both drought and the bronze birch borer. So something like that would be very common to be seen after drought. And well, and this one's um, a little too late to save. Yeah, I'm afraid but this one's gone. Toast. <laughs> <laughs> but part of the reason it's it, it it died so quickly is the stress from pre a drought in previous years. Correct. Okay. So, and this can also happen to viburnums? Uh, yeah, the viburnum borer, uh, when you start seeing dieback, look at the base to make sure that you're not seeing holes and that sawdusty material we call frass. Um, that's a good sign that you have viburnum borers, which will become worse after the viburnum's undergone some stress. So basically the stress from drought makes the trees susceptible to damage from insects and, and diseases dis for right. years to come. Exactly. So, and you've got another example, in fact, from uh, Pagoda Dogwood, which is the same tree behind me that has the curled leaves. Right, yeah, and there's a little dieback on it right now, and this orange material right here, this is a disease that's called golden canker. And we do see some of it in years that we it's have yellow. regular moisture. But we are going to be seeing more of it as a result of the stress caused by the 2012 drought. Okay, so uh, again, fungal diseases are going to skyrocket. Right. And soil-borne diseases that attack compromised root systems like verticillium wilt, which causes dieback. I expect we'll be seeing more of that. We'll probably be seeing more oak wilt, which is vectored by insects that will attack stress trees. So we may be seeing more of that as well. So what can we do then in, in years after the drought, especially I, I, I think about full-size trees, you know, I'm not so worried about my lawn, I can recede that fairly easily, but right. full-size trees can be a lifelong investment. What can we do in years after a drought when we see these, these uh, symptoms? Well, even during the drought years, you should water, even though it seems like a large tree should be able to take care of itself, it's not the case. Most of the roots are gonna be in the top 12 inches, and when we're several inches behind in our water deficit, we do need to water. So, for example, a tree such as the maple behind us, uh, you should probably put down about 60 gallons of water in a 10 by 10 area around the uh, circumference of the trunk in order to make up for some of that deficit. You wanna put down about an inch of water a week and that 60 gallons in a 10 by 10 area would cover that. So people who think, don't just water at the trunk. No, a watering try to get can all isn't that. gonna do it. <laughs> okay, so a sprinkler or, or, or a drip hose or something. Right. And we're watering long after the drought, we think the drought has ended, we're watering into winter. Right, well, just about in, into late fall, certainly, especially if Mother Nature doesn't cooperate and give us an inch of water a week. So a rain gauge might be kind of handy too, because a if, rain gauge if it rains, great. you don't need to do it. Yes, exactly. Okay. And so water basically until the ground freezes. Yep. And then in the, the following years, if we see signs of some of these borers or insects or disease, Call, call you? your county <laughs> extension agent okay. and get that uh, identified, whether it's caused by an insect or whether it's caused by a disease. You may still be able to save that tree, especially if you identify the problem early enough. Okay. And then a tree is worth a lot. So tree is worth a lot. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Shelley. If you're looking for a drought tolerant full sun plant that's almost carefree, boy have we got the plant for you. 
I'm at Rotary Gardens in Janesville with the Director of Horticulture, Mark Dwyer. And Mark, we're talking moss roses. And boy, have they come a long way since I saw them and played with them years ago. These are not the moss roses of my childhood. They are not, and, and it's one of those things that in terms of um, developments, breeding developments in particular, the moss roses or portulacas are becoming more and more prevalent in our landscapes, not only for the drought tolerance that you mentioned, but the beautiful colors. It, well, these, yeah, I mean, I remember very, just single flowers, kind of scraggly looking plants, so maybe it was the way it was taking care of them. But uh, th this bed behind you is just a wave of color, and I'm mm -hmm. seeing doubles, stripes, uh, colors that I didn't even know existed with moss roses. Right, and, and again, the amaz amazing part is the developments in not only the doubles, but some of the streak petals. Uh, there's a great variety called uh, Happy Hour Peppermint, which is pink with some neat uh, kind of magenta striping and stippling through it. Now, the, the portulacas, they're, they're native to South America. That's Brazil, Argentina, Ur uh, Uruguay. And what's interesting about their, their growth rate is they love our, our hot, dry Wisconsin summers. Better than I do. So great in a, in a container or a drier portion of a bed. And again, that flower power is something that's very prevalent. And it begins very early. It's important to mention that the, the flowers do close up. Uh, their peak time of bloom is between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. Really? So but, it's, it's a midday plant. It's not going to, I didn't realize that. Right, you won't see them in the evening. But the breeders are now trying to have these portulacas that have a longer period of bloom. And they've even done a major refinement on our traditional purslane, which is also a species of portulaca. Well, purslane is a common garden weed. I mean, this is something most of us are trying to get rid of in the vegetable garden and in bare mm -hmm. soil. Now, it happens to be also an edible garden mm -hmm. weed. So right. are any of the moss roses in that category of being edible? I'm not sure about the traditional grandiflora species, but mm -hmm. Oleraceae, which is traditional purslane, we have some varieties that were bred for flower power that are right behind us. So they would also be edible. Okay, so check the label on some of these. You could have flowers and uh, some edible leaves for your salad. For sure. And it's important to mention that those leaves, uh, as, as a vegetative plant, it's one of the most nutritional plants that are out there in terms of greens. Right, right. Uh, and and they, they do taste great in a salad. Mm -hmm. So, right. I mean, you know, again, functional, edible, pretty great. Mm -hmm. um, now, you tend to take one plant, something like this. I mean, this is kind of a special display. Uh, it won't be here every year. Correct. Right. Each year we like to select a certain seasonal or annual of choice and we, we grow every variety we can. So oh. last year, for instance, was marigolds. We've done salvia, snapdragons, etc. And moss roses, we've always grown here in those tough, sunny spots and always enjoyed them. So we thought, why not? So we ended up locating 65 varieties. 65. Wow. And boy, have they filled in. They've been very low maintenance for us. And I think few would argue that, that again, that flower power is amazing, particularly with the doubles, which have larger flowers and the very vivid coloration. And uh, what about, okay, care, full sun, mm -hmm. um, fertilizing, I mean, what do we do with these? Well, full sun or part sun, the issue with oh, part really? sun is okay. you'll have less flowers. Full okay. sun is ideal. Okay. Fertilization, um, we typically will fertilize once a month with a, kind of a, a lower mixed fertilizer, a liquid feed or something of that nature. But if your soil's halfway decent, uh, they'll be fine through the season. So really a carefree plant that way. They can take very lean soils. And again, with a little more nurturing, you'll get a little more growth and some better flowers. So again, we would fertilize at least four times over the course of the summer. Now, these are all uh, very low growing. Is that pretty much the, the growth habit that we're going to see? So if I'm using these in a container, they're going to just they're going to sit there. They're not going to cascade over or anything like that. It'll be a minor cascade. You're right. They don't get over 12 inches in height, okay. but they tend they'll spill over in a little way, but they're not okay. a cascader, so but a great ground cover. Yeah, that's what I'm seeing. I mean, uh, just this, the, the beautiful stripes behind us are, are gorgeous. Um, do you have any favorites? Well, aside from that happy hour peppermint, there's all <laughs> sorts of neat names out there that refer to the, the colors. And usually they're in a series, meaning there's happy hour peppermint, happy hour banana, which is a beautiful yellow. And it goes on and on. So in terms of color range, there's just such a wide range of colors. And it's a subjective thing. We all like different colors. Sure, yeah. But if you're looking for reds, oranges, whites, peach, uh, there's some that are very um, light colored in terms of like a terracotta even. So tough to pick an, a specific favorite, and that's why we encourage people to look at them, take pictures, and, and find them the next year. Well, and that's why you do one, one specific plant so that people can really get a sense of what, what it looks like. Right, side by side. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. This is fantastic. Um, as I said when I first saw these, I've got to get me some of these. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mark. You're welcome.
you're looking at photos of an auto salvage yard just outside of Mineral Point. Lovely, isn't it? <laughs> well, now fast forward about 12 years and you're looking at paradise. We're in the home and garden of Jennifer and John Sharp, just outside of Mineral Point. And Jennifer, you looked at those, you looked at this 12 years ago and you saw potential that I'm not sure anybody else could see. Uh, this is incredible and it's also an official wildlife habitat. But I looked at that, that photo and think, I'd run screaming the other direction. <laughs> what on earth made you buy that piece of property when it looked like um, a junkyard? <laughs> well, it has a beautiful stream and it's also right around the corner from Mineral Point. So, and also, I might add, being artists, it was well priced. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, but it, so it was the water and the location. Uh -huh. And yet you probably had horrendous cleanup to do to make it not only livable, but pretty. Well, it was clean on the surface. They'd taken the junk off, but we ended up getting 12,000 cubic yards of dirt that the DOT was getting rid of. And okay. we had it hauled and we had the whole place capped with about two to four feet of clay subsoil. Oh, clay, that's good. <laughs> yeah. Right. So you had to not only rebuild the soil, uh -huh. you, well, tell me, you built, you built everything here. Uh huh. Uh, tell me about that. Well, we built a few, we tried to do an energy efficient green built home, actually universally accessible too. And we started because on the north side, we needed to have protection for the house. We built a berm and we used old cement slabs that we'd gotten from our property <laughs> as the base for our berm and then put other rocks and dirt on top and made a rock garden. And at one end of that, it almost looks more like a southwestern garden with those beautiful grasses. Well, John's a Utahan, and so that's his western cactus garden. Well, nice of you to let him have a little piece of garden yeah. here. But when you say we built, you literally, you and John built the garage. You both you hands-on built the house. Uh -huh. In fact, you did the rock work on the corners of the house. Yeah. John did some of the bigger rock work. All the bigger rock work. Yeah. Um, he has a, a special toy. <laughs> He's, he is mad about skid steers. So we're talking really, really, really big, big rocks. Big rocks, yeah. Okay, and yeah. so throughout the garden, you can see examples of his work. Yes, we have rocks everywhere. It, with it being a salvage yard, did you have to worry about soil contamination at all? I had it tested for heavy metals at the university lab. And yes, the lead was high. We're in lead mining country in addition to the salvage yard, but we have 8.5 pH soil so they said that lead was all bound up and it was not a concern. Well, there you lucked out there. Were. So, so the plants did well, the, um, everything's happy because well, it's not contaminated. It's not contaminated because it's capped, but I had to build soil for the plants to grow in. We got the city leaves for many years and made all our soil from leaf compost from the city leaves. Well, I heard of starting from scratch, but this is taking it to a new <laughs> level. Well, let's talk about some of your favorite places. Um, there's so many, but I would assume because you bought this because of the water that the stream is one of them. Yes, we like the stream and John has done a great job with all the rock work along the banks of it. He pulled out m much junk and other cement slabs, but we left one car body, or I had it left at my <laughs> insistence to show what it was. And kind of old, a memento? <laughs> yes, and an old safe. You have an old safe in the stream? Yes. And is that useful for anything? Or? Well, we joke that it's good for cooling beer. <laughs> And maybe a little heavy? Yes, too heavy, heavy to, get, to out. get out. Well, and near the near that same area, you've got uh, like a, a rock garden interest going There's on too. There's a crevice garden, which is one of the newer things people do with rock gardens. And we, I made that on a sand pile from rocks we found on the property when John was cleaning up the stream bank. Well, and you've got windows throughout the house that look out on all these pieces of, of beautiful gardening. So far, one of my favorite spots is right here, this, yeah. this herb garden. That's my other favorite place because it's right outside my kitchen window and it's green just as soon as the snow melts in the spring. So beautiful location right outside. You know, we shouldn't forget also, um, you've got a very productive vegetable <laughs> garden going on too, but really everywhere you look, I mean, wildlife sanctuary, running water, um, it's fantastic that you turned, that you saw the vision of an auto salvage yard and turned it into this little piece of uh, quiet and beauty. Well, we're both, we were both professional artists and finally we wanted to do something for ourselves by ourselves. I think you did a fantastic job. Thank you for sharing it with us. You're welcome. <laughs>
what an oasis. It's difficult to believe that the Sharps Garden really was once an auto salvage yard. For more information on all the topics we covered today, please check out our website at wpt.org, then click on the Wisconsin Gardener. I'm Shelley Ryan. Thanks for watching. Funding for the Wisconsin Gardener is provided in part by the Wisconsin Master Gardener Association.